overjoyed and very excited to be able to announce that Charles Eisenstein is here to share an evening with us. Enjoy. Hi, everybody. Hi. So I always wonder how to begin um, coming into a new city where I don't know people and what's on everybody's minds. So I generally, uh, hopefully I, I am able to have a meal with people before, uh, before I begin or have some conversations. And so I'm just going to kind of pick up on a couple of things that came up at dinner. Um, uh, Trevor and and Kent were talking about some of the uh, larger events that they'd had before, and, and they asked me to guess what Evolver events drew the most people. And it turned out that they were things like UFOs, um, <laughs> ayahuasca, you know, like, um, what else was there? Schizophrenia, like, like kind of um, mental, like these kind of, well, what, what, what unifies them? Well, it was, it's about, coming from one world and going to another world. And today I'm going to talk a bit about how money fits into all that. Because I think that we sense that what's happening in the economy and what's happening, <laughs> someone's not really happy about this. <laughs> what's happening with money and what's happening with the economy, we sense that it's not like some little blip some little bump in the road that we can smooth out and everything's going to keep going back to normal. Um, but we sense that the crisis of money goes in some way all the way to the bottom and it's tied in with everything else. And it's not hard to understand why we would think that because money seems to be linked to everything that's happening. I mean, as they say, money makes the world go round. And probably most people in here are activists of one sort or another, or have passionate beliefs uh, about um, what's wrong with the world and how it could be improved and, and uh, political views. Um, and when you, when you investigate any of these issues that are present for us today, and you ask, why is this happening? It doesn't take long, two or three whys down the road, you get to, well, somebody's making money off of it. You can't escape money. You, can't, you really can't almost talk about anything without talking about money. And in all of these issues, it seems that money isn't our friend. The beautiful things that we want to create, the healing that we want to make happen on this earth, Money is usually on the other side. You can make a lot of money, for example, by becoming oh, a lobbyist for a petrochemical company, a lobbying Congress to relax restrictions on dumping toxic waste. There's a lot of money in that, but there's not a lot of money in going and cleaning up toxic waste uh, or in stopping. There's a lot of money in building housing development, but usually you're not going to get rich by devoting yourself to stopping a housing development. You can pave over a wetlands and make lots of money, but when you try to restore a wetlands, there's not a lot of money in that. And so this leads me to the second thing that came up at dinner. Uh, the observation, someone said, you know, when they came to Portland, they thought that this was going to be like a total hotbed of, of kind of spirituality and, and all that um, consciousness kind of stuff, right? Um, and I'm trying not to let any uh, facetiousness get into my voice here. Um, but, they, you know, they thought, but, but they found out, no, like, people are very politically aware. Uh, um, there's a big environmental consciousness here, but those people aren't necessarily into, you know, whatever UFOs or things like that. Like, that's kind of a little bit too far off the deep end. Um, and more generally... Maybe some of you have noticed that at least up until recently, the kind of spiritual folks and the political activist folks 
were, they were definitely two separate camps. But one thing that I've noticed, for example, with the Occupy movement is that these long sundered branches of, of um, the evolution of society, they're, they're coming together again. At one time, the activists said, how can you waste your time sitting on the meditation cushion when the world's burning? Come on, we gotta do something. And the spiritual folks said, well, how can you do something wisely if you don't even understand your own self? But today, I think we're, we're realizing that both fit together and that in a way they were both right. So, now yeah, where was I going with that? <laughs> yes, where I was going with that is why do I call it sacred economics? So there's two things. One is just what I was talking about, how money isn't your friend uh, when you're trying to heal the planet, or even on a personal level, often the beautiful things that you want to do or, the, or just the things that you're in love with, there's no money there. Say you're an artist and you just want to create this beautiful art and make beautiful things, but uh, have you ever you talked to the career guidance counselor and the counselor says, well, you could go into graphic design. <laughs> like, like, why? Why should it be that way? Why should money be not our friend? Because really money, it's just a social agreement. It's, at bottom, it's what society says has value. Why have we decided that paving over a wetlands has value and restoring a wetlands does not have value? What is it about money that makes it into a force for evil? That's, the, that's kind of the starting question in, in this book. And it's not a rhetorical question, the question is answered, and the answer then points the way to how money could be something else, how money could be something that you might call sacred. In other words, money being aligned with the beautiful things that, that, that we're coming to value today, the things that we want to create on earth. The other reason I call it sacred economics is a bit more general. It's about healing this divide between spirit and matter, this division of the world into two parts, one material or fleshly and the other uh, spiritual or of consciousness or of the mind, these two separate realms. Really, what we need is to treat the earth as sacred and the earth is spiritual and all matter is spiritual. It's not a matter of becoming less materialistic, but I would say becoming more materialistic, loving matter more, loving the earth more, and ending the separation between spirit and matter. Um, and, and these sound like kind of generalities, but I'm gonna make them, I'm gonna try to make them very specific today. So I'm gonna start talking about money from the perspective of um, Well, why it is that it's not our friend, and incidentally, why we learn to hate Monday. <laughs> like, this really bothered me as a kid. Something in me thought that, that it was, that, like, life can't just be that. That, that you, you trudge through your week, wishing it were over, looking outside, wishing you were playing outside, doing things you didn't care about for an external reward, waiting for the weekend. I just felt that, that life was supposed to be more beautiful than that. And I think everybody, at least everybody young, and anybody young at heart has this feeling too. It's the feeling that you know, you're at some job and, and maybe even if you're getting paid a lot of money, you're like, I wasn't put here on earth to do this. Certainly you can understand that if you're doing some kind of menial labor, but even if you're not, we have these gifts that we want to devote toward a divine purpose, toward a beautiful purpose. So I'm gonna talk about, well, 
I'll just start. Um, to make a very long story short, the problem with money today, and this is simplifying it a bit, but the problem with money today has to do with the way that it's created and the way that it circulates. It's created as interest-bearing debt. There's other problems with money too, besides this, but this is the big one. Um, so it's created as interest-bearing debt. Uh, M0, as they call it, base money is created when the Federal Reserve buys an interest-bearing security on the open market, like a treasury bond or something like that, or you know, junk mortgage things. Um, and so the Fed's balance sheet the amount of, of these interest-bearing assets on its balance sheet is always greater than the amount of money, than the amount of base money. The same thing is true of M1 and M2, other categories of money that banks lend into existence. So if I'm a bank and you come to me for a loan, say you want to borrow $10 million, maybe you have a good business idea, and I say, sure, here's $10 million, you owe me $20 million over maybe 10 years, right? Well, maybe that's not a problem because you're gonna build a solar panel factory and you're gonna, or you're gonna, you're gonna um, create an awesome restaurant and give people lots of great food and they're gonna be happy to pay for it and you're gonna make the world better, okay? And you're gonna pay me back that $20 million and you're gonna get rich yourself, okay? Right, no problem, right? The problem comes when everybody's in the same boat because all money originates in the same way. So in other words, there's always more debt than there is money. In other words, everybody is always in competition with everybody else for never enough money. It's mathematically part of the system. It's built that way. No matter how much, you know, even if you, you say lots of new age mantras about abundance and prosperity and there's enough for everybody, <laughs> And I'm not actually disparaging those. They're, they're kind of an easy target. Um, and they might be true for one person, but the nature of money is that it has scarcity built into it. It's like a game of musical chairs. No matter how abundant in your attitude you are, there's never enough chairs. There's always, it, that's the way that the system is set up. We're always in competition for not enough money. The only way you can pay back your 20 million is to take that from somebody else. Everybody's in that boat. Now, you may not actually be an entrepreneur. Maybe you're just going to work for somebody. And why will they give you a job? It's because they're going to help you make that money. Ultimately, all money originates in this way. Now, the situation isn't quite as bad as I said because there's a complicating factor here, which is growth. So everybody's getting 20 million, I mean $10 million, and they have to pay back 20 million, that means half the people are gonna to have to go bankrupt, right? Well, no, because by the time all of these debts come due, I'm gonna have created even more money. So the old loans will be paid off with the new loans, but that creates even more debt. But that's okay, I'll create even more money in the future, forever and ever and ever. <laughs> yeah, right, sounds quite reasonable. And it would be reasonable if we had an infinite planet. If we could continually create new goods and services. The reason that you don't like Monday and the reason that money does not seem to be your friend is because of what I call the iron law of money. It says, money shall go to he or she who will make even more of it or who will work for somebody who will make even more of it. Now, what kind of things can you do to make more of it? Well, you could maybe drill for some oil or cut down a forest or create a service to sell to somebody. Whatever it is, though, it has to be a service that is sellable for money. So if you go to the bank and you say, you say, I'll be the banker today, okay? So you say, Charles, I'd like to borrow $10 million to restore this wetlands. And I'll be like, okay, but what product are you going to create? Where's your business plan? 
and you say, well, I really am, I'm, I'm not going to sell it. That's the guy over there who wants to pave it over. I, I don't want to do that. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I can't give you that loan. Only if you make a product out of it. Say that you want to teach people um, how to do things for themselves. Say you, say you want to start a neighborhood childcare co-op so people don't have to pay for daycare anymore. Say that you want to go and just help homeless people. Like say you have some beautiful thing that you want to do. If you're not making products and selling them, then no money for you. Now there's some exceptions to this. They're called gifts. Sometimes people will give you money for doing something even though you're not going to make them more money in return. And that's actually the key to right livelihood today if you don't want to participate in this conversion of the world into money. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm saying basically is that money forces us into competition, creates artificial scarcity, separates us from each other, causes and necessitates endless growth. Uh, the other thing it does is it destroys community. The reason it destroys community is that community is woven from gifts. You can't have community without gifts. As you may have noticed, if you go to suburbia and you try to, to create community, as I did when I moved back to America after living abroad for a long time, and I thought, well, I'll start community in my neighborhood and I'll be really nice to people. I'll invite them over to my house. And people came over. You know, there'd be 8, 10, 15 people in my kitchen, you know, in my living room, drinking their beers, you know, and talking about inconsequential things. And, and eventually I realized why it wasn't working. It was because everybody underneath had the unspoken knowledge that I don't need you. Because I, I meet all my needs by paying for them. And in fact, I don't want to need you. I want to be financially independent. I don't want to have to depend on anybody. I don't want to have to owe anybody anything. But real community isn't like that. Real community, you need each other to, you need, need each other to, to supply the, the necessities of life and, and the pleasures of life too. So you might go, so you go back a generation. In my childhood, there were a lot of things that we didn't pay for that people pay for today. For example, childcare. Like we got home from school and we ran around the neighborhood and we could go into anybody's yard Everybody's yard was our yard, except for that mean lady. <laughs> and we could even go into people's houses and get fed snacks. So childcare was generally not a, a service in the economy. Neither was cooking. Today, two thirds of all meals I've read are prepared outside the home. You go to the supermarket, you get the deli food, you take it home, put it on the table, that's dinner. But when I was a kid, mom cooked dinner. She bought raw ingredients and she cooked dinner. So we didn't pay for food preparation. And you always saw neighbors helping each other out with product, projects. People would maybe even fix their own roof. They wouldn't necessarily hire a roofer. But you would fix your own roof, you'd do your own projects, and people would help each other out and they wouldn't pay for that either. You take it back another generation before television and before well, yeah, say before television, to my father's generation, when he was a kid, he said every Sunday, the whole neighborhood would get together and they would sing folk songs and play guitars. So they, yeah, right? So they weren't paying for entertainment. We didn't pay for play when I was a kid. We'd go outside and we'd play with each other. We'd, we'd, create, we'd create worlds of the imagination. You could call it the kingdom of childhood. And now I try to get my kids to go outside and play and there aren't kids outside anymore because they're all inside and they're paying to play. They're playing, in fact, they're having these online adventures, World of Warcraft and RuneScape and things like that. Uh, Minecraft is the new one. And they're, Minecraft, you build things. Like you build forts on the computer. <laughs> you, you, yeah. And, and World of Warcraft, you have adventures. You travel around and have adventures. So we're paying for the things that we once got for free. Take it back three or four generations. Like people didn't pay for 
housing very often. They built their own houses. They sang all of their own songs. They created their own dramas. They, um, they didn't pay for medicine. Various village grandmothers knew, knew about herbs and they did most of the medicine. Well, all of this is invisible to economists. All of these things that we do for each other that create community, that, that make us value each other, these are invisible to economists. And economists would say, well, when you start paying for childcare and paying for food and paying for medicine, then you're all better off. GDP has gone up. GDP goes up and there's more lending opportunities. That's what the politicians are talking about when they're saying we've got to boost consumption, boost demand to increase economic growth. Because now, hey, here's a business opportunity. You can start a child care, a child care business. You can start a lawn mowing business. You can start a house cleaning business. You can start a food preparation business. You can start something and make people pay for things that they once did for, that they once did for each other. So basically what's happening is you're strip mining community. So, um, now, let me tell you the good news, okay? Okay. All right. But, you know, um, I, I like to go into the, to, to the bleakness of it first. Um, because, like, I'm actually really optimistic, and I'm, I'm painting um, a really beautiful vision, I think it's beautiful, at least, of what our society could look like. And... I mean, I spent a lot of years in despair when I was involved in, oh, I, I would read all the peak oil stuff and I would read about all the environmental crises and I would read about the barrels of radioactive waste that haven't quite started to leak yet, but they're in undocumented sites that are so secret that not even the government knows where they are. Like all of these terrible things happening and so I, I think it's really important that the optimism that I express isn't coming out of an ignorance of the magnitude of the crisis. Because otherwise it wouldn't be authentic, you know. So, the good news is that there's not really very much community or nature left to convert into product and into services. That's a, there's not much left and that's a problem from the point of view of the money system because the money system stops working if there's no growth. Because how are all these debts gonna be paid if I can't lend new money into existence? I can't lend it into existence if there's no new opportunities to create goods and services. And that's what we're seeing happening today. The banks aren't lending. There aren't any lending opportunities. Not enough to keep pace with the growth of debt. So the debts grow faster than our incomes. When that happens, the system can stay solvent for a little while by, you know, if I can't take from your increased income, I can take the things you already have. I can take your house, your car, your pension fund. I can take, and I can make you pledge your future income. And I can take all of that, but then, that, that only works if we're going to return to growth sometime. That's, and, and, and we can't because there's not much more that we can pay for, that we don't pay for already. Uh, you know, and we've postponed this crisis for a long time. Like, well, how about other countries? There's other countries where people still do things for each other. Let's force them into the money economy. That's called opening new markets. And so we did that. Or you can have a war and destroy some things and then you can create new goods and services to, to replace the ones that were destroyed. But we're having a big crisis now because uh, colonialism has basically run its course. The co colonized countries are beginning to resist. I mean, there's still some room left to strip mine their communities, uh, but that is running out of room. Total war is no longer an option. You know, war can't proceed past a certain point before we begin nuking each other. So too bad, that solution's out. Um, there's not that much more of nature that we can convert into product either. We can't increase the fish catch anymore or the amount of oil being drilled or the amount of bored feet of lumber being harvested or the amount of atmosphere that we convert into waste. That's all running out too. So when the politicians say we've got to reignite demand, they're 
trying to do something that's no longer possible and it can only be done for a little while longer at a higher and higher cost. Like, yeah, you know, if we build the Keystone Pipeline and, and, and you know, do some fracking and mountaintop removal and drill in the wildlife refuge, you know, maybe we can eke out a few more years of tepid economic growth, but not enough to make the system really work. So the system is falling apart, and if you want to make it fall apart faster, then you can protect anything that's good and beautiful, uh, because that deprives the system of food. So if you stop, yeah, right, if you stop a road, um, stop some development from happening, uh, teach people how to do things for themselves, teach people how to heal themselves, uh, spread knowledge about herbal medicine, spread knowledge about nutrition, reskill, have reskilling workshops, learn how to cook again, uh, teach people how to garden again, do permaculture, all that kind of stuff, that deprives the machine of its food. It hastens the crisis, but it also mitigates its severity because it means that there will still be some wealth left after things fall apart and the collapse will look more like, less like a collapse and more like kind of a, well, you know how it is when things fall apart, don't you? That's really the only time that I ever change my life. In fact, usually even when things fall apart, I don't change right away, but I try to make them work again. And then at some point I realize that that's never, never gonna happen. And eventually I'm like, okay, I'll try a new way. Um, and that collapse looks different for different people. For some people, it's the deathbed for maybe a severe alcoholic. The collapse might have to be almost total. I think it really depends on how much love that person got in their lives. So another way to look at this, another lens to look at what we can do, practically speaking, is anything that spreads a little bit of love in the world. That's actually a political act. And I gave the economic reason for it, because it, it reduces the amount of room for growth. But there's also what you might call a spiritual reason for it. And this is the reason that we can feel in our hearts, even when our logic denies it or can't figure out why. Like, why should it be significant to just do these small acts of generosity, you know, or uh, to, to help a stranger or to pick up a kitten, a lost kitten, or to, be a, to, to sit in hospice at the bedside of a dying person. All these little invisible acts our, our hearts know that those, are, that those are significant. But logically, why should that matter? Why should anything you do matter, in fact? Like even if you're super eco green and, and you recycle all of your whiskey bottles <laughs> and you never touch a plastic bag because you don't want to contribute to the 3,000 mile wide continent of plastic floating in the Pacific Ocean. Well, like, so what? That's just one bag less. I mean, you could have an ecological footprint of zero and live in the forest eating roots and berries. And so what? It's not going to make a big difference. Maybe you get to feel good about yourself. But it's logically, it's not going to make a difference. But we can feel that it makes a difference. So I think I'll explain... I'll talk a little bit about the, the shift in logic that is healing this divide between what we know in our hearts and what is reasonable uh, in our heads. Because I said that the economic crisis goes all the way to the bottom. So what's really transitioning here? I would say that what is changing today is nothing less than the defining myths of our civilization. I mentioned that money is nothing but an agreement. You could say it's a story. 
It's a system of interpretations of symbols. That's what gives it its power. And the story of money is tied to deeper stories that are invisible. And those are what I call the defining myths of our civilization. And there's really two of them that are primary. One of them is the story of the self. And the other is the story of the people. The story of the self answers, every, every culture has one, and it, it answers the question, who are you? What is it to be human? What's, and therefore, what's important in life? What's valuable? What's the purpose of human life? And the answer to the question, who are you, in our culture has been, well, what you are is a discrete, separate being in an external universe, separate from other discrete, separate beings. Everybody agrees. Religion says, yeah, yeah, your soul encased in flesh. And the soul, that's the real you. So you're separate from the flesh and you're separate from all this other matter out there. Psychology, yeah, you're kind of this ego or this mind or this consciousness, again, inside flesh. But that's not your essence. Cut off your arm and you're still you, right? So you're not any of the physical parts. Biology, yeah, that's right. You are the, uh, the expression of your DNA. And you're out there among a whole lot of other expressions of their DNA and you're separate from each other. In fact, you're competing with each other seeking to maximize your reproductive self-interest. Economics, yeah, same thing. You are the economic man, this atomic individual seeking to maximize rational self-interest. What else? Physics, you're this kind of automaton um, made of these mechanical parts uh, in an objective universe. And this is all obsolete, by the way, but in... <laughs> It's obsolete. It's obsolete biology, it's obsolete physics, it's obsolete psychology. You know, it's, I'm ignoring the whole, all the stuff about the social construction of self and um, quantum mechanics, observer, observed, uh, non-distinction. Um, I'm ignoring uh, horizontal gene transfer in biology, I'm, all kinds of stuff I'm ignoring. But this is still the, the picture that, that dominates our culture and from which our governing institutions arise, and a lot of our own habits too. I call them the habits of separation. So it says that's what you are. And our money economy is part of the story, because in our money economy it's true that more for you is less for me. I explained how it drives us into competition for never enough money. It makes it true. So it's, you could say that it's, it draws its psychic energy from, these, from the story of the self. It makes it true. Now you might be thinking, this story is obsolete. Like, I don't believe in that anymore. I believe in something else. I believe in a connected self. I'm not, I don't think I am separate from other people. I don't think I am separate from the universe. I think we're all together, right? This is the new consciousness. Often we find that we have to fight against the money power to stay in this new consciousness, that the money power wants to keep us in that separate self. It says, oh, you can't, you won't be okay if you act as if other people's interest were your own interest. What about me? So money pushes us away from this new consciousness. However, the obsolescence of the story of the separate self is pervading now all of our institutions that are built on separation and they're all falling apart. Not just money, but say medicine too. The idea of conquering the other. That worked pretty well when we were talking about bubonic plague, but it isn't working very well when you're talking about autoimmune diseases, which are rife today. What other can you conquer? Or allergies, or AIDS, or obesity? Well, maybe AIDS, you could look at it through that lens. Although I think HIV is more of a symptom than a cause of AIDS. But anyway, that would be a whole other topic. Um, okay, so we're, we're, 
we're living in this place between worlds. And I said I would explain why money is related to this kind of journey between worlds. Uh, the other story that creates our civilization is the story of the people. And that answers also a lot of basic questions. Where did we come from? Where are we going? What's the purpose of humankind on earth? What's important, again, what's important in life? Why are we here? And that story I call Ascent. And it says that we started out as helpless animals. We had no science, therefore we were ignorant. All we had was superstition. And we had no technology, therefore we were helpless. But thanks to our big brains, we developed science and technology and came to dominate the world. We became more and more through history one triumph after another, we became the lords and masters of nature. And we transcended the limitations that bind other animals. We harnessed natural forces. First, we harnessed the animals, we domesticated the plants, and then we developed machines. And our control grew more and more perfect. And then we took science and we began to apply it to the human realm, political science, social science, economics. And the story says someday our control will be complete. Someday we will have conquered the atom. We will have nanotechnology. We will engineer. We will we'll overcome death. We will synthesize food. We won't even need nature anymore. Maybe we'll just have nature in some museums or some gardens. But this is like the science fiction of the 50s, right? Like you'll, food will be a synthetic pill. You'll have cities in bubbles, right? Bubble cities, that was supposed to be the future separate from nature. Separation, separation, separation. People really resonated with this two generations ago. It's obsolete today, right? Today we're not excited. Yeah, I'm going to participate in the conquest of nature. That's my destiny. I'm going to develop, I'm going to develop a better chainsaw, a better bulldozer to knock down those forests faster. Like most people are not, that's, we're not resonating with that. That's still where the money is though. Because money is part of the story of ascent. Because it compels endless growth. But our hearts aren't in it anymore. But they were even two generations ago. You know, where you're a little kid in the 1950s, he wanted to become an atomic scientist. You know, in the 60s, he wanted to become an astronaut. Right? Everybody, you were a hero. If you developed a faster way to cut down the forests, you were a hero. You were a captain of industry. And, and everybody was sure that this was our destiny. And we still, invisibly, that myth still has a lot of power. You know, what's the next medical breakthrough in the war on germs, the war against cancer? Right? Still, all of these military metaphors of conquest. So th these myths live with us, but they're breaking down. The breakdown of the money system is part of this breakdown. So, um, I guess I should tell you the new story of the people too. And then I'll say a few words on how money could embody the new stories. The new stories of the, of the connected self. And the new story of the people. Which... Well, I'll tell you how, how, maybe some of you have read this in the book and stuff, but um, boy, it sure sometimes seems that humankind is nature's big mistake, you know? <laughs> you know how Agent Smith in The Matrix describes our species? Yeah. He says... During my time here, I've come to study your species. <laughs> I discovered that you are not animals. Mammals. Thank you. All mammals come into a natural equilibrium with their environment, but you humans do not. You move to an area and you multiply. 
you multiply until every resource is consumed. The only way you can survive is to spread to a new area. There's one other species that does the same, it's a virus. You human beings are a disease, a cancer on this planet. You are a plague and we are the cure. And so you have to admit Agent Smith has a point there, right? <laughs> Although I think he's being very unfair to the viruses. <laughs> but it's actually not as unnatural as you would think uh, to have this exponential growth. There are times in nature, there are situations in nature where there is exponential growth or very rapid growth. Uh, in an immature ecosystem, for example, if there's a forest fire, burns down the forest, you get these opportunistic spe species that come in and they colonize the soil as fast as possible. They compete for soil and for sunlight, but that's just a short phase. Then they come into a um, more symbiotic steady state relationship. Um, children grow quite fast, unsustainably fast. <laughs> a fetus, like pregnancy is totally unsustainable. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that it's unnatural. Uh, and what happens with pregnancy is that, is that the growth at some point when it reaches its limits, it triggers a transition, a transition, a, a birth process. So I think that that is what's happening today. Humanity has grown and grown inside the womb of mother nature. And now we're reaching a limit and we've triggered a birth process. And all of these crises, all happening at the same time. Why are they all happening at the same time? They're all happening at the same time. Economic, ecological, soil, energy crisis, water crisis, you name it. Education, healthcare, politics. The, these are a birth crisis. And humanity is entering really a new world. So we're talking about this transition between worlds. We're entering a new story of the people. The metaphor I like to use the most is the metaphor of adolescence. Because you have, at the end of childhood, you have this final growth spurt. And then you reach the limits of growth. And what happens? Well, two things happen. when the growth ends. And you could almost look like the politicians that, that their current efforts to kind of squeeze a little bit more growth out, that would be like having, you know, like I've got a 15 year old, he's 6'1". And he was growing really fast last year, guys, but this year he's hardly growing at all. Something might be wrong. You know, maybe I, maybe I should give him some growth hormones, you know, keep him growing, because I have to, right? That's kind of what the situation we're in right now. Um, but, but ordinarily, so you, you grow and you reach the limits of, of your growth and your whole life you've been receiving from your mother and your father your, and you love them, right? Your love relationship, though, is one of receiving. Anything that you give back is kind of a token. The Father's Day card, you know, or something like that. It's a token, but really your role is to receive and, and I'm, I'm good with that with my kids, I don't want them to feel that they have to pay me back. I'm not gonna give them a bill when they turn 18 for services rendered, right? <laughs> it's, it's a gift, it's a gift relationship and they're the receivers. But, and that's what love is. But when you enter adolescence and you become mature and your stage of physical growth is slowing down, then a new kind of love relationship happens. And that is one of mutual giving and receiving. It's very primal that you want to give a gift to your sweetie. Very primal. That's what is happening to humanity. And as a mass movement in the dominant culture, in mass consciousness, it happened, it began in the 1960s when we really reach the limits of growth, everything since then has been kind of the, the dregs. 
That's when the last time that the, the economy had six or seven or eight percent growth was in the 1960s. It's never been that high since. So we reached the limits of growth and we fell in love with Earth. The environmental movement was born and we no longer saw Earth as just something to receive from, but we wanted to take care of this beautiful planet too. It happened, you know how yin gives birth to yang when it reaches its extreme, so we, and vice versa, and so we reached the extreme of separation in the late 60s when we really left Earth behind. The astronauts went up there in these little self-contained bubbles, these spaceships, and they went up. And this was the, this was the you know, science fiction was coming to fruition. We were leaving Earth behind. But what happened then? From this vantage point, the, the astronauts looked down on Earth and they, they all had spiritual experiences, you know, they all fell in love. I quote Rusty Schweikart in my book, and I can't remember exactly what the quote was, but he said something like, you know, I looked, I looked out at Earth from the moon and it was just this little blue dot. And I realized that everything precious to me, everyone I've ever loved, all of history, all of literature, all of art, everything was on this little blue dot that I could cover up with my thumb. And I was never the same again. And maybe some of you are old enough to remember the first images, the first photographs. Like, that might have been the first time you saw Earth with no borders. It was a profound experience how beautiful it was, you know? And so we, we, Earth became, I would say, really the object of our adoration as we came of age. That's what's happening. Humanity is coming of age. And we're falling in love with Earth. That's the new story of the people. You desire to give back and then you desire to co-create. The other thing that happens upon this transition is usually some kind of coming of age ordeal. <laughs> when everything falls apart, in primitive cultures, this coming of age ordeal involved intense physical pain, isolation from the village, psychedelic plants in large quantities, uh, physical deprivation, um, hunger, thirst, whatever it was, it, 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 your world fell apart. Everything that had seemed so permanent and certain and unquestionable became questionable. It, it, it became insubstantial. And that's happening to us too. A generation ago, there was nothing more permanent and real and practical and prudent than blue chip stocks triple A bonds, and your pension. But now these things are being revealed as, as very unreliable, impermanent. And for a lot of people, the world is falling apart to the point where people are getting vertigo. And this is normal. This is what happens when your identity falls apart. And in a tribe, then, then you, would, you would graduate into a larger identity, an expanded identity and you would become a full member of the tribe. And so, to extend the metaphor a little further, we could say that humanity is becoming a full member of the tribe of all life on Earth. And you might notice that all of the beautiful things that you want to do, whether there's money in them or not, all of them in some way draw on one of these two stories or both, probably both. They don't make sense if you look at a human being as a bubble of psychology floating around in a universe of other. They're totally irrational, but they make sense from the understanding that you are me and I am you and, and I am everything and everything is me. Then they're not irrational anymore. And this is a truth that we could always feel. 
but our logic said otherwise, and it was hard to reconcile them. But now we're beginning to learn a new logic, which means that you no longer have to think that you're crazy. We still have uh, a journey ahead of us here because money and many of our other institutions and many little voices in our own heads are still very much immersed in the old story of the people and the old story of the self. So one thing that I write about is, is what would money have to look like? And what would other institutions, in the ascent of humanity, I write about other things besides money, um, but what, what would our institutions look like if they were aligned with the new stories? One model I take is gift culture. These communities that we once had. In those communities, it was not true, like it is in a money economy, that we're all in competition and you're Good fortune is my bad luck. In a money, in a competitive economy, that's true, right? Because we're all in competition for not enough money and you break your leg, ha, one less competitor for me. But in a gift economy, you break your leg, that's one less person to give to me. Because in a gift economy, people do not accumulate. Wealth in a gift economy is not how much you have. Wealth in a gift economy is how much you have given. Because the more you give, the more people want to give to you, too. The more grateful they feel. <laughs> so even if you're a selfish bastard, you still want to be generous. <laughs> this is so foreign to our thinking. It's, it, we're so conditioned to think that, that altruism is a kind of a self-sacrifice. Going at, we have, that we have to fight ourselves to be good. Fighting ourselves to be good, that is, I bet everybody in this room has habits that are built around the struggle to be good. Maybe you evaluate all of your actions and see whether they were justified or not and how you could do better. Um, most religions are in some way about overcoming the self, overcoming sin, overcoming fear, overcoming whatever. Um, it's the war on human nature that, that reflects or interiorizes the war against nature. That's part of ascent. And so we're so used to that. Uh, but in a gift economy, it's not true. So in a gift economy, you don't even need a golden rule in the gift economy because it's self-evident. As I give unto others, so they will give unto me. As I do unto others, others' well-being, that's my well-being too. It's, it's obvious. Because in a gift economy, if you have more than you need, you give it to somebody else who needs it. Not only because you like them, but also because that's where your status and your wealth and your, your positive self-image and everything all, all come from. So that's one of the metaphors I draw on in describing what money could look like. And I'm gonna, I'll describe it a little bit and then we'll go to questions and answers too. Um, so, there's like six or seven pieces of it, including internalizing costs, negative interest, social dividend, localization, peer-to-peer -peer and gift economics, um, um, shifting taxation onto resources and land. Um, there's, there's various pieces of it. I'll, I'll just go into one of the key pieces here um, just to kind of give you a flavor for some of the more nitty-gritty aspects of this. So it's the negative interest part. Because um, I described how Interest on money is what drives this competition and this endless growth. So what would happen if money didn't bear interest? What would happen if money, in fact, were like everything else in the universe that decayed over time? Or it were like possessions in a gift culture, 
in a nomadic hunter-gatherer culture, that, that you, if you held on to them, they were a burden. What would happen if money were like that too? See, today money, it violates ecology. Because in ecology, everything cycles back, returns to its source, decays. But nothing's permanent. But money is permanent. It doesn't decay. In fact, you can even make it grow with time. And you can, we can talk about inflation and stuff. There's you know, some complications. But basically, you can put your money in a risk-free investment. And it will, at least it would appear, last forever. And so we attach ourselves. Money is so linked to self. My money, I was ripped off. You know, We attach self to this permanent thing, which kind of leads us to think that maybe we're permanent too. That's our security. We intellectually know that we can't take it with us, but we act as if we could. Okay? And so it violates the spiritual law of impermanence. It violates the ecological law of return. So what would happen if money decayed. All right, so imagine, see we have maybe 200, 300 people here. So suppose right now I'm the richest guy in the room, but it's not a money economy. I'm the richest guy in the room because I have 500 loaves of bread. I'm the richest, and you guys don't have any. So how do I stay rich? Suppose I'm a selfish bastard, okay? Well, I can't just keep all the bread because it's going to go stale. And if I do that, in a few days, I will be the lord and master of 500 loaves of stale bread and everybody's going to hate me. <laughs> so if I want to stay rich, I'm going, to have to, I'm going to have to, well, I could give it away or I could give you a zero interest loan. Say, here, I'll give everybody a loaf of bread, nice fresh bread and if I ever need bread, I will call in that loan. Or if you have bread, you can pay me back. If I say, I'm not going to give you this bread unless you pay me two loaves of bread in return, I don't have the leverage to do that. Because you know that it's just going to go bad anyway. So that's kind of the, um, the simple version. I mean, this is really, really sacred economics could be called kindergarten economics. Right? It's like, if you have more than you need, let somebody else use it. Right? I mean, that's... It's, and so the question, the question is, how do you translate this into a, a modern money system and not, you know, just have, be this pie in the sky, well, you know, everybody should obey kindergarten morality. Like, how do you actually translate this? Well, so what you do is you subject bank reserves to a liquidity tax, to a negative interest rate. So if, you, if I'm a bank and I have a billion dollars and I keep it in the Federal Reserve and I don't lend it out, it decays at, say, 5% a year. So, and so the, the interest rate floor called the zero lower bound it drops now below zero. The zero lower bound drops. So basically any risk-free investment is going to have a negative interest rate. So the bank now has, it's in its interest to lend at zero interest. The bank still makes money because if you're a depositor, you're going to deposit at maybe negative 4%. The bank will lend out at 0%. So actually the banking system would work almost the same way. But what would be different is that you wouldn't be able to get richer merely by owning money. And this would allow, uh, this would be a money system that works even in the absence of growth. Because today, like, I'm not going to lend. If I'm a bank, I have a billion, I'm not going to lend to you unless you're going to pay me even more back. Right? And overall, that only works if the economy is growing. So now we, 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 we reduce interest rates to zero and below money can be lent into existence and circulate without having to have economic growth. Um, so for those of you who are economically astute, you'll have all kinds of questions coming up. And I'm just going to say that this is a very broad brush um, explanation. And the book has a lot more details. But I'll say one more thing about it. 
And this is, again, one of like six or seven pieces of the vision. Um, but I'll say one more thing about it, um, which is that negative interest also reverses the discounting of future cash flows. By which I mean, say you own a forest, a nice Pacific Northwest virgin redwood forest, and you have a choice. It's worth a lot of money. You could cut that baby down for a for billion dollar profit. Cut it down and pave it over, maybe. Okay? Squeeze every dime. A billion dollar profit. Or you could log it sustainably and make $10 million a year forever and ever and ever. What would you do? How many people here would cut that baby down? All right. <laughs> right. Yeah, you cut it down because you could take that billion dollars and put it in treasury bonds or something and get 20 million a year, not just 10 million. Well, someone else can worry about that. But, right, but economically, right, economically, the incentive is to cut that baby down. But suppose you're, suppose you want to preserve some air for future generations. Suppose you're a, a nice person and you say, no, I'm the CEO, damn it, and I'm not going to cut it down. Well, that's fine, you're the boss, but now a corporate raider comes and says, ah, oh, this company's poorly managed because look, that asset could be generating $20 million a year and it's only generating $10 million a year. So I'm going to go to the investment bank, borrow some money, buy your company, cut down the forest, the higher revenues will mean a higher stock price, then I'll sell the company again, pay the investment bank, and make a profit for myself. So as CEO, how do you stop this hostile takeover? The only way to stop it is to cut down that forest to raise your stock price. So, right, market discipline hardens a soft heart, as they say. So, and that's all because that billion dollars is going to be generating interest. But if, if a billion dollars were subject to negative interest, then you'd rather have $10 million a year forever. Suppose you are not now the president of a, of a timber company. Suppose you're the president of Earth. You're the boss. And aliens come and say, we'd like to buy Earth. <laughs> right now, gross world product is $60, $60 trillion. We'll buy Earth for 10 quadrillion dollars. The interest alone is way more than 60 trillion dollars a year. So would you say yes to that? We're gonna, when we buy it, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna smash it to smithereens and use it to build an amusement park in another galaxy. <laughs> <coughs> Suck off the oceans, right? Will, will, you, will you take this offer? Well, you wouldn't, would you? But as a matter of fact, we are, right? We're converting the world into money for a purpose that is alien to anybody, anybody's well-being. And that's because of interest on money. So that's one of the pieces that, that really, it's a, on the one hand, it's a very, very small change. It doesn't require dismantling the whole banking system, although the banking system would eventually change radically. Um, but it's a, it's a very evolutionary change. And it's very close to happening. I think the, the, the central banks are trying to push interest rates as low as they can because it's not working anymore. Lowering interest rates isn't stimulating economic growth anymore. They're pushing them as low as they can, but they can't push them below zero. Um, but that's really mostly a conceptual barrier. So, okay. Let me see if there's anything else I wanted to say. I think... There's all kinds of other stuff. I could go on for hours. There's other stuff that come into this. Um, the third part of the book, I told you the first part is the, is the old stories and how money embodies those. The second part is the new stories and what money would look like that were aligned with those. Uh, and the third part of the book then is, on a personal level, how do we begin to align ourselves with the new economy and the new myths that underlie it? And this is something, so this gets more into the area 
depending on your vocabulary of, of spirituality or, or practice um, or ethics. I, um, I think we're all experimenting in this, in how to live according to what is becoming true today. It's new territory for us. Our social institutions and our habits are all of separation. And we really don't even know how to live. A lot of us are really in this place between worlds. We're through with the old world. We're not of that anymore in our consciousness. We're still trapped by some of its intuitions, by some of its structures, but we're really not of it anymore. But we're not in the new world yet either. We're in a very sacred and pregnant place, the place between stories. And I think actually just giving ourselves permission to abide there for a while is really helpful. And I'm not advocating inaction. I'm just advocating uh, waiting for the right action to arise. In the old world, we know how to get things done through the laws of cause and effect as we understood them. There's a plan, there's a map. But in the new world, we don't know yet. And ultimately, the kinds of cause and effect that operate there are, are different than what we're used to. And we have to follow intuition and synchronicity a lot more. Um, besides, the things that we want to create on Earth are basically impossible. As you realize when you look and see just how bad the crises are, they're impossible from, from the premise that you are this separate consciousness inside a flesh robot in a world of force and mass that you can only influence through the amount of force that you can direct. I mean, come on, the powers that be have way more force than you do. We have to create miracles, really. A miracle being, it's not the intercession of an external divine agency in violation of the laws of physics. A miracle is simply something that's impossible from an old story and possible from within a new one. It's an expansion of what is possible. And I, I bet everybody in this room has experienced miracles before. They could be social miracles that violate the laws of human nature. They could be material miracles that violate the laws of material nature as we've been told. A medical miracle, for example, a miracle of healing, a miracle of forgiveness, um, a miracle of synchronicity, a miracle of something that science doesn't explain. Um, so I'll just put that out there because um, even though I talk a lot about kind of this economic nitty-gritty, um, there is a numinous dimension to what's happening. There better be. <laughs> so, Trevor, were we going to make an announcement before we begin the Q&A or should we just begin the Q&A? Here comes Trevor. I'll, I'll, I'll say like, um, rather than pass the mic around, I think you guys can just ask and then I'll repeat it into the microphone. Thank you. 